by mm. the nature of the school being so unique, one common factor among the families is that they're all willing to go outside of the norms yep. and to question the longstanding principles of our current society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I know you'd have more information on demographics. <laughs> yeah, interestingly, to sort of piggyback on that point, I think a career path that is overrepresented in our alumni and in parents of our current students historically has always been entrepreneurs and, yeah. and small business owners. Mm -hmm. Exactly for that, that sort of <laughs> willingness to try something different. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs, so that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Burr. Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I am here with Cody and Pepper of the Circle School in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Welcome. Hello. Hi, Don. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. So I like to jump right in with storytelling. So I'll give you each a chance. Tell, tell us, our audience, a story about someone who really took advantage of, of what the Circle School has to offer. And it could, could be Pepper or it could be anybody, uh, but someone who really got value out of what, out of being at that school. Mm. Well, I'm going to talk about myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, so I am now a Circle School staff member, but I'm also an alum. So right. I spent my last five years, uh, basically eighth, eighth through 12th grades at the Circle School. And I, uh, I was getting fine academic value out of public school. I was a straight A student and never had any issues with that. But what I came to realize of, during my years at the circle school was that I associated part of my value with the ability to chase the carrot of good mm. grades and the adulation that came from achieving good grades. Mm. And so when I think about the path that I was on in life, there was a shift when I went to the circle school and it was a shift towards discovering what was genuinely satisfying to me and not mm. sort of the shallower satisfaction of pleasing others, but instead mm. the deeper satisfaction of understanding and pursuing things where I found genuine satisfaction internally. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was, that was a huge value that I got out of the circle school and particularly having that take place in my teen years was a huge value to me. Mm. Right on. I never went to a traditional school, so I don't have my own experience in, you know, normal schooling to compare it to the way Cody does. But I have some friends who go to a more traditional school now. And mm. I feel like the ways in which I'm spending my time at school feel truly valuable and educational mm. to me. And I feel like it's helping me, you know, move forward towards the next stages of my life. And some mm -hmm. of these friends that I talk to, I hear a lot of, oh, it's just busy work. They're having us do this stuff that's, you know, not really important. And it doesn't really make you think. It's just, you know, find the answer and prove that you can follow the instructions. Mm -hmm. Which, <laughs> very grateful to not be in that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what, what are some of the things, Pepper, that you're, that you're pursuing as learning interests? So I'm working on getting college credits before going into college right now. Mm -hmm. I've also been learning American Sign Language here at school. I've been crocheting. I've, you know, learned <laughs> doing a little bit of like medical responder type training here mm -hmm. at school for a while. You're first aid certified, right? I got first aid CPR certified mm -hmm. here at school with staff members here. Nice. Oh. You're helping to plan and fundraise for a large field trip large, to Utah. Yeah, hiking okay. trip. I'm a part of a like hiking group here. Uh huh. We're going, yeah, doing a lot of fundraising work and stuff like that. I was part uh -huh. of dance planning here. Huh. Sort of the logistics of like organizing events and stuff. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. 
Yeah, and I think I think all of those things add up to you taking a big step towards adulthood and the way mm-hmm. that that people once you're outside of a schooling environment, you take on the responsibilities that you need to and that are satisfying to you yeah. and you learn to balance those. And mm-hmm. so I think you are taking those on in a very like organic, authentic way. Yeah. And something that's less specific to me is in an environment like this, like you really need to learn time management mm. and like what's important to you. You're not following somebody else's calendar mm. for every step of your life. So. Yeah. Right on. So Cody, can, most of the people listening to this may not be familiar with these kinds of environments. So mm. give a sense of, of how the adults enabled that kind of learning to happen. What is your role? Sure. Yeah. Two primary components that come to mind for me immediately. One is holding space and the other is modeling. Mm. So holding space, creating an environment, contributing to an environment where kids have autonomy to choose how they Mm -hmm. spend their time and where, where they have the freedom to, where they're sort of afforded the same ability to author their life that they mm. will be for the rest of their lives in mm. a traditional school that sense of authorship is postponed until adulthood but we think that at least at the circle school what we believe is that the best way to be ready to steer your own life in a satisfying way is to start doing it and practicing it mm-hmm. uh, as early as possible so part of it is is contributing to an environment where that is possible mm. and then the other part would be modeling mature development our kids, we have a an age mixed program. Students as young as four and a half and as old occasionally as nineteen, typically mm-hmm. eighteen, so K through twelve, are all here at school. And it's a mixed age community among the kids and as well as the adults. So everyone here is modeling their various stages of development. And it can be a, a really wonderful thing where younger kids look up to older kids. Some of the older kids <laughs> <laughs> some of the excesses of being a teenager are sometimes moderated by having younger kids around. Mm-hmm. And my mm-hmm. job as an adult is to to show mature development, to show balancing of life skills and, and to mm-hmm. be of assistance to, to everyone else who's growing in the same way. Nice, nice. So one of the things that democratic schools often have is some way of resolving conflicts and making decisions. And they're not the same as other kinds of schools. So, and and I want to hear this, you know, kind of from both perspectives of sort of adult and and what does that mean in the space, kind of holding and modeling and and using that system, but also having someone who's been doing it since I think you said four. Um, yeah. You know, like I want to hear what what how how did that land for you uh, over time about that kind of conflict resolution and making decisions. How does it work or how do we personally feel about it? How do you, so you'll probably have to tell how it works in order (laughs) for people to understand what the experience was, but kind of both, um, but grounded more in the experience. Like, like, did you get it when you were four? (laughs) I think so for conflict resolution at these schools, at the circle school, we have JC, which is our judicial committee and we have mediation. And then, of course, informal interpersonal conflict resolution happens all the time. Mm-hmm, but JC is more for like rule breaking at school. Mm. Um, and anyone, students or staff, can like write a complaint if they think a rule has been broken. And then it gets heard by a panel of students and staff, which includes a JC chair and a JC scribe, which are both mm. students who've been elected to the position and trained on how to run the JC. Mm. Now, When I started at one of these schools, I was four, but my parents were very involved with this model of education. Hmm. And so they understood it and they weren't, you know, asking me questions about it and being like, Hmm. well, that's weird. Like, how does that work? (laughs) And so I never really considered the alternatives to it. I was like, well, how would you solve a problem if it's not, you know, everybody kind of deciding together how it, you know, works out. And so it just, it felt very natural to me. It is Mm. in some ways similar to like a jury system. Mm -hmm. So there's not really a real world, you know, example of how conflict is resolved in schools. You don't really have just an adult who gets to tell you, yeah, that's wrong. 
I've decided you're, you're right, you're wrong. You pushed him. I've decided that that's what happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. And, and talk about the role of adults in that, Cody. Sure. Yeah. So Pepper talked about our judicial committee, which is modeled after, essentially after the U.S. judicial system. And then we also have our school meeting, which is a direct democracy, votes on rules, votes on who can be here, use of the property, things like that. And so my role essentially is to be involved in it and sort of demonstrating how, how people come together and make decisions. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of, a thing that I try to do, I have an improv background. So, I, and a, an improv motto is yes. And right. so that's something I try to incorporate here. We have people of various stages of development who use our school meeting oftentimes, ideally as a tool to achieve things that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And so I want to support that system sort of executing at a high level, sort of, you know, if we pass a rule, I want the rule to be well-written. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, I want to be sort of yes ending the ideas that kids bring. So to, mm -hmm. to work with them in partnership to say, okay, well, here's what you want to do. Maybe you're ready to do it totally on your own. Maybe there are some areas where you would appreciate some help. I want to be there to meet there with you and work in a, in partnership wherever you're at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so th the role of adult is to be an equal member of this community. That sounds like what I'm hearing, right? Yeah, that, that's right. And, you know, I would say maybe the more in the con broader context of education, maybe the more radical way to put it would be that the role of student here is to be an equal member. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Is that, I mean, you, you said it yourself that, that it's about modeling. So, so the lesson, the curriculum is that process, is let's do this. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna tell you about it in the abstract. We're going to have you do this every day or every, you know, whatever the, frequency of the meetings are whatever but it's it's you know when people talk about uh, immersion language immersion you know it's like okay we're going to do you know half our day or all of our day in this other language that's not your the 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 dominant language in that community and so i think that that's to me that's a way of under, better understanding what the how it works is it is immersion it's immersion in democratic living absolutely um, and and so and so like you said, uh, Pepper, you know, it's like, well, don't know anything else <laughs> if you've been doing it since you're yeah. four. It's like, that's just how life is, isn't it? <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, John Dewey was clear, you know, he he was, you know, writing in the 1890s until he passed away in the 50s, I think, but but he wrote about education until the 30s. But he said, he, he was one of the people who originally said, like, you know, living, dem democracy is not a... A voting system <laughs> mm. it's a life it's a way of living it's a way of living in community and and so it's like i think that the true legacy of dewey is not what are traditionally called progressive schools even though that's a movement that came out of his work it's it's the democratic schools because that's living the you know living what he was saying mm. even if he, even if no one in the movement actually references him <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting i've noticed that yeah, but yes, yeah. I would I would agree. I think democracy is self-determination and we want kids here to experience self-determination just as members of society here here in America or or broad more broadly in the world experience self-determination. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I would agree that yeah, it's it's immersion. Um one of our mottos is practicing life. Yeah. So you you come <laughs> to school and you just you live your life now. It's not this thing that's postponed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's another Deweyan <laughs> saying. So so one of the things that I find interesting about about communities in, in this vein of schooling is that many of them develop certain code words or jargon <laughs> that are unique to the school or, or, you know, to the movement. Is there any particular things, uh, you know, code words or jargon in your community that you think might be beneficial if it was a, adopted more widely? Hmm. <laughs> That's a fun one. 
Yeah, I, I immediately can think of some, except they're disqualified by um, some of them are so specific to an environment like this that they wouldn't be helpful, more widely adopted. But that also might be interesting. Mm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think so many of them are just like silly little shorthands for things that are at school that well, aren't in that. the broader world. Like we have school buses that come to pick people up. Oh, okay. And at the well, at the end of the day, after the buses, there's most students are gone. But right before closing, we have like these mm -hmm. 10 minutes where you're supposed to be up front at the building ready to get picked up because you're about to leave. Right. But for the 10 minutes before that, there used to be alarms that would go off that made quacking sounds. And so now at 3.40 every day, 20 minutes before closing, people will say, oh, it's duck time. Like, we got to get our stuff and get ready. It's duck time. <laughs> we can't start, you know a new game on the computer because we have to go soon. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. So duck time. Yeah. 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 I'm thinking of two. One, which do doesn't apply, apply broadly, but I think is kind of funny. We have a chore commander. Who, <laughs> <laughs> the way that the school is kept clean is that everyone does a chore each day. Mm -hmm. So we don't hire janitorial services. And at 2.15 at chore time, everyone joins their teams and each team will be assigned an area. And we have a chore commander. And actually yesterday and today, it's Pepper serving as chore commander who will look and see who is absent and who is at school and adjust the teams as necessary. Mm. And we, we liked the the semi-alliteration of having the two Cs. I think that was the reason commander was chosen. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and another one that I'm thinking of, actually a third C would be certification. Mm. So that's something when I'm doing admissions visits and showing families around the school, I always try to explain certification. And um, essentially, there are groups called corporations that can, they're typically tasked with maintaining some group of materials and making them broadly accessible to students. Mm. So for instance, right now, we're in the music studio. There's a music corporation that administers the area and uh, one of the primary ways that they do that is through certification, where before you can even come into the music studio, someone from the music corporation will certify you, and they'll explain the rules of the of the space, how to use the area and potentially the materials safely, both for the person and for the materials. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a it's a bit like getting your driver's license in a way. You can right, right. There various things throughout the school you can be certified for. And that's also usually a way to kind of manage fr from an outside perspective, you're managing risk within the space and, you know, around, yeah. around potentially dangerous items or activities. Is that the way I always heard it said was anything expensive, dangerous, or super, super messy <laughs> ah. is what we want to generally have certifications around. Uh -huh. So we have certifications for music equipment because it's expensive. We have certifications yep. for art supplies because they're messy. And then we have certifications for like science equipment because some of it, you know, actually, I don't know if our science equipment gets uh, <laughs> interesting, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if we have uh, dangerous Maybe science equipment. Kitchen, the, the kitchen have, is what I was thinking. The kitchen, yeah. That's typically the one. That, yeah. 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 Oven Although, and chef knives. Yeah, yeah. The tutorial school has fencing equipment, so. Oh, yeah. That's cool. That's fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was I was actually saw a thing on uh, Facebook at Summerhill. They had somebody making swords. They were making uh, a wooden wooden katana and 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 various you know Japanese samurai type swords. So I was like, hey, swords at school. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. I, I'm curious. Do you know is there something like a certification process that you have to go through before you can use the fencing equipment? Yes. So so Mo at at, at the tutorial school was saying. That, yeah, it's it's it. There, it's like a corporation kind of set up. They don't call it corporation, but but yeah, there's a there's a group. They they handle things. I actually asked about that. They they have less formality, so it may not be, you know, like a formal system of certification. But there's you know, there there's a there's a a way that you get access to those things. It's not just a free for all. Um, that makes so, sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, it, that's another interesting thing is the variations in level of formality is, you know, all over the board. Uh, and so it just depends on, you know, I think a lot of it is size of community. Uh, tutorial school is actually pretty small, so it's it's not, uh, it doesn't require much formality. And it, it just also might depend on history and, and how, how things came about. So, uh, yeah. 
Um, yeah, probably personality of the founders, right? Sort of stage of maturation in the organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of the schools, most yeah, most of the schools I've been interviewing so far are, are tend to be very well established. Long, you know, have been around a long time, um, and and so that was actually my initial focus was I really wanted to be having the conversation with schools that, and, and you guys are perfect examples because you know, one alum and one somebody who's been in for life is is wanting to get that per sense of perspective on how this works what it is uh and and actually you were mentioning you're in you kind of do admissions uh tours and things like that and so is there a way that you describe what the school is or how it works to people kind of when they're when they're when they're not familiar with it like some particular line of of analogy or 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 way that you describe it uh, yeah, I would say, man, I had my, I feel like I had my elevator pitch really well refined when I first started working here. Cause all of a sudden right. I was delivering it to people who kind of wanted to know, but didn't want to know a lot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but now I talk more to people who are here for a couple hours because they're very interested, but mm. my elevator, elevator pitch to describe the school is, is something like sort of the fundamental premise of this school is is fairly optimistic and and it's based on mm. the idea that in general people want to and are capable and are driven to live satisfying lives mm. and that if you give children the space and the time to experiment and to mm. to discover what is genuinely satisfying to them and genuinely dissatisfying to them that they will learn how to navigate their lives and develop skills based on that drive for independence and satisfaction. And so mm -hmm. we create an environment where children are free to do that. Nice, nice. The example I always give based on that is the way that a baby will learn how to walk and talk without formal instruction. They just see mm -hmm. people around them modeling the behavior and they want to be able to emulate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait, so, so you didn't attend walking classes as a child? No, I, didn't. <laughs> I was very advanced. I just decided, you know, to give it a shot. <laughs> no, I tested no. out of crawling two hundred one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Pepper, do you run into a challenge explaining it to your peers when you run into kind of just other kids your age in the in the general public? <laughs> Well, it doesn't actually come up that often. Most people mm. just assume you go to a school like them and, you True. know, you just sort of go along. What's your favorite class? Oh, ASL. You know, I take <laughs> yeah. ASL classes. It's just by choice. Yeah, yeah. When it does come up, it's actually not that hard to explain. I've explained it for, you know, my whole life, right. really. But you just give them the little elevator pitch and they're like, oh, that's weird. And they kind of just move on with their lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And people are generally receptive to it when you do have a deeper conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's the deeper conversation part that's really challenging. I was at the village free school for a year, and and we went to the courthouse, and it was a day when which school groups were all over this courthouse. Okay, so it's like the county courthouse, and we go into this one. It's a it's a, a interesting court where they like have really rapid fire stuff. Like they, they have people coming in, they do a thing, they switch to the next one. But in between those, the judge was like recognizing schools and saying, oh, what school are you from? You know, and, and so we're from the village free school and, and we're a small group. But she asked. And of course, I I'm not taking, you know, lead on explaining the school. I let the kids do it. And so one of the girls is like, oh, we're the village free school. And, you know, and then the judge is, you know, giving that kind of scowl and skeptical look that some adults do. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then she has her explain it. You know, it, it, and of course we know we don't have time, but anyway, she she says something like, "Yeah, we we get to do anything we want," <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. which is like, oh, okay. And and you know, the judge didn't have a very positive response, but <laughs> like, okay, whatever. <laughs> you gotta be able to read your audience. Yeah, yeah, and she the the girl who was responding was probably, you know, ten, you know, so hadn't hadn't developed like the full uh, articulated response that that an older child might have had yeah you know, or someone with longer she was she was also i don't think she'd been in the school for more than a year or two so you know mm. but it was fun it was interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh -huh. that was probably the most important thing to her about the school and and yet when you're explaining it it's important to include the context for how there are limits to 
and anything you want and actually why the freedom to do what you want is a good thing yeah. <laughs> right right exactly exactly and that that I mean that's part of why why I put this show together is because I I wanted to be able to kind of talk to people who are who are in it and 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 living it because I'm not currently I'm I'm just kind of doing my own thing writing books and stuff but I wanted to be able to have a forum in which we can really probe some of the details and 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 have a deeper conversation about what it means and how it works and and for me in particular that that means kind of probing on those on on the decision making and the and the uh, uh conflict resolution because that to me is the curriculum mm -hmm. some people th say curriculum and they only mean you know books and directed academic activity and it's like i think that's mm -hmm. not an adequate notion of curriculum i don't think it even describes what what regular schools do i don't think it describes that yeah. well is they're they're also an immersive experience it's just they're an immersive experience in something so different that that it has different consequences <laughs> and, and i think that understanding curriculum as a social structure as much at least mm -hmm. as much if not more than whatever arbitrary things you happen to make other people do or have other people do in the process of it um, to me that's really important is is saying you know, Cody doesn't tell Pepper what to do, <laughs> you know, and, and Cody might go to Pepper for uh, some expertise that Pepper has and Pepper won't tell Cody what to do, except within the context of, oh, you're the expert, help me out here, <laughs> you know, and, and that can go either way in, 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 in life. And it's only in a certain kind of school that that it that the adult is the only recognized authority and kids aren't yeah so so that's where i think it's really important to acknowledge that that what what you've what the school has created is a structure some people say mm -hmm. these schools aren't structured and i disagree vehemently yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is structured it's structured in a very specific way but it's structured for autonomy and and for a form of equality that recognizes some people are experts in things and should be recognized for that expertise, but everyone has a certain equality in terms of just how we're going to relate to each other and make rules and solve conflicts and, the, and you know, those being the central things. So. Yeah. yeah, in many ways, the, the structure is the actual curriculum. Right, um, exactly. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll offer a critique of public school and then a critique of one of our structures. Mm -hmm. I, I actually like to sort of ask like what are what are people actually learning from this so mm -hmm. if if you look at a public school i think uh the thing that people are really learning that tends to stick with you for a lifetime is to follow instructions to mm -hmm. subjugate your own interests and desires mm -hmm. and and to just expect that to be how your life is right right and my my so i would have a a bit of a critique of our judicial system i think mm -hmm. it um in many ways is very successful but i think for many people it can sometimes become th the default if there is ever any sort of conflict or disagreement mm -hmm. pepper mentioned there is a lot of informal right. sort of working things out and that's true but i i do see some people for whom going to the jc the judicial committee is the default and so what mm -hmm. i i, I look at that and I think, okay, well, what are these people learning if you're, if mm -hmm. that's the way the system mm -hmm. is being used? And I would say in that, in that case, what you're learning is that if you have a problem, you take it to a third party arbiter mm -hmm. and, and have them resolve it for you. Right. But yeah. in my adult life, uh, that's, that's <laughs> not a system that's available to me. And it's, it's one I wouldn't yeah. choose to use if it was. Yeah. You don't yeah. take your neighbor to court because you <laughs> wish they were more quiet. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's one of the things that, well, in particular, because I have so much experience with the village free school is that they've actually had a judicial committee for many years, but uh, somewhere around 10, 10 years ago or so, they had a financial crisis and had to change campus and they moved into a very small campus and, and dropped the formality and, and, you know, having moved a few times and expanded again, they did, I, I found out, picked it up again for about a year recently, but it lasted about a year and then went away. But but part of what they recognized was that, you know, they had a context in which they couldn't let things wait. And then, and then sort of because they'd been 
together for a lot, you know, the, the staff had been together for a long time and a lot of kids were in there for long term. They just basically, as an organization, seems to have built up enough skill in informal resolution that that, that sort of uh, is more, more what defines how they operate now. Um, but they're also very clear that, that they're not tied to however they're doing it now. They, it can change tomorrow if they don't think it's working. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, I think it is important to look at what are the kids. And, and that's part of what they were realizing is, you know, if this isn't working, uh, you know, what we don't want is just to have things fester or, or, or not work. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's, yeah, that's democracy in action. I, yeah. I, um, I have a feeling that for communities of of self-determined people schools like ours in order for the group and for the organization to thrive it sort of has to be self-renewing and mm -hmm. continually reflecting what works best for the people who are there mm -hmm. so i yeah i think continuing to use a system that was adopted by students of previous generations just because it's the way that it's always been done is actually not not really effective you can end mm -hmm. up sort of playing this game of telephone where you're, <laughs> you're you're doing an imitation of an imitation of an imitation mm. of, of the thing that worked for other people yeah yeah, yeah. right so, on. yeah that ability to choose what works best for the group I, that's inherent to democracy and and to self-determination and i think right. it makes places like this vital when that's happening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so Tell me, tell us a little bit about the camp. You're in a music room, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have that kind of, tell about kind of, uh, how, how many students do you have? What's your capacity like, like, and then a little bit about just campus and facilities, what you, what kind of things you have available for in general? We have about 50 school meeting members, students, staff okay. right now. We had, when I first started at the school, in the upper 80s, but that number dropped during COVID and it's been rising back up again since then. Mm. In terms of facilities, I mean, we have music room, art room, science room, we have a kitchen, we have a lot of more informal spaces, we have a library, but then there's spaces that are just sort of open to interpretation, just rooms with tables mm. and chairs and, you know, some kid is going to go in there and you know, build a little bit of a fort and someone's going to go in there and play a board game or have a meeting. Mm -hmm. So how the spaces that are used can look very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the building is nestled into an eight acre campus. Oh, so nice. we have a large yard and it includes um, some wooded area, which is really nice. People like to go down into the woods and uh, hang up hammocks when the weather's mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, um, Very cool. And we have like a gaga ball pit, tether ball, a soccer field, small soccer field. Mm -hmm. but... Probably not Olympic size. No. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. But you have a, you have eight acres. That's actually quite you know that that's a yeah. very great thing to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the building is quite large. The way it's designed, there's sort of a central area. We call it the commons. Mm -hmm. It's very large. It's in the center of the building. It's it's got uh, very high ceilings. Mm. It's just a general use space, but it's also where our school our uh, school meeting meets on Wednesdays, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then the other rooms are sort of all off to the side of that central area. Mm -hmm. hmm. Very cool. Yeah. So it's it's a large space. It's it's fairly um, sort of modular, and that many of the rooms can be used for different things. Right. And right. It, yeah, it works well for us. Nice. Nice. One of the things that that is interesting to me is. So, so you have a school meeting, um, and that runs the day to day. Do students are are and this depends on laws in different states. Is do you have like a legal entity that then has to manage things beyond that, and can kids participate in that legal entity? Hmm. Yeah. So we're we're a five hundred one c three nonprofit. We have a board of trustees mm -hmm. that governs the corporation. Okay. There's sort of a bicameral structure where there's there's the board of trustees, which are responsible for the medium to long term future of the school, and then mm -hmm. there's school meeting, which is students and staff responsible for the the short to medium. Okay. So there's a little bit of overlap there in the medium. Yeah. Let's see. I I think it's unlikely that a student would 
be elected a trustee, although it's I think it's possible. It's not uh -huh. okay. I, I've heard it discussed before. We oftentimes we have many alums who serve on our, our board of mm -hmm. trustees. Right on. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it depends on, on like one of the schools was I, I can't remember which one, you know, trying to, you know, have kids involved. I know the village free school they they their legal entity is I think what they call the circle, um, but anyway it was chaired by a nine year old for a while so mm -hmm. you know whose whose mother was the president of the board so that helped uh, sure. uh, but but you know it's just it's a curious thing to me that you know and and people helping people understand that there is a school meeting and then there's usually some kind of legal entity that has to kind of hold that space and it varies from place to place whether or not kids are involved whether they have an interest in being involved. And and whether they're even legally allowed to be involved. So so that's you know something that that's like the behind the scenes stuff that the adults sometimes have to do behind the scenes um, because it's just not available. Uh, yeah, so. and you know I guess thinking about it, I guess what I would want would be that if there was a student who was really interested in school governance mm -hmm. and started at the school meeting level and really had a passion for it and wanted to work their w way up to be an being involved in right. the board of trustees, I would want to help them be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, a thing that we sometimes talk about is having opportunities to sort of stair step your way up in right. things. Right. And so I wouldn't want a student to just start to say, I'm right. interested in Dropped this. In. Yeah, just put me right, on the right. board of trustees. <laughs> that wouldn't seem like a good idea. But for that student who is really passionate about that to work their way mm -hmm. up to it, it seems like that could be a really great experience. And right. some and probably if they're that interested in it, they'd probably be a really great contributor. Right, yep. right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and and that stair-stepping is interesting. I had uh, also the Village Free School. Uh, my first involvement for it before I did my study and stuff was um, just volunteering there, and, and I was uh, volunteering in the office, and I had these, I think they were nine, ten-year-olds. Anyway, they decided to, they wanted to learn how to run the office. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and in particular, they wanted to answer the phones. And because it's kind of crucial business function, I was like, huh, okay. I was not confident that they could, you know, deliver messages. <laughs> so I set up this whole system for practicing where, where I'd literally have, I, I would call a parent, have them call back and have the kids take messages <laughs> and then deliver the message to me, whatever, you know. And so anyway, it's one of the things that I think is interesting is that because everything, uh, up to that trustee level is available to the students and 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 it's characteristic of these schools to say you're interested great do it <laughs> you know now it may require some facilitation and edu you know practice in some way mm -hmm. but it is by by philosophy philosophically and, and just kind of by default available in some way and i think that's an important thing to note mm -hmm. sounds like you did sort of an informal certification process with them yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what I was doing. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, and I mean, Pepper, um, Pepper does a little bit of front desk coverage for us in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, our, uh, our, our, we had a front desk person who resigned unexpectedly, and so uh, we have been in the short term coming up with creative solutions to fill the various roles that that person performed. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, for from three o'clock to four o'clock. Sit yeah. at the front desk, I, you know, observe parents coming into the building and make sure they don't wander off. And I make sure that their children are aware that they're here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start working on a little bit more. I, I don't know Send, We've like these little informational packets. I'm going to be mm. working on uh, doing those. You know? Do you answer the phone at all? No. Okay. <laughs> I do not. Um, that has not been discussed. The phone is, you know movable so yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's another thing is that the this was you know not everyone had a mobile phone yet so yeah <laughs> it was it was you know a, a few years ago uh, i mean it yeah. is a landline phone but it right you know, right removes from its post it, yeah. in the history of the circle school there was a time where i think phone coverage was was divvied up a fair bit and sometimes included student coverage and I, I, this was this predates my time at the circle school. But what I've heard from my buddy Jim, who's been here since the beginning, is that parents used to say that 
in in that age trying to contact the circle school was like trying to contact a cloud <laughs> <laughs> that it was fairly unreliable trying to if you had a message that had to get to someone you couldn't really depend on it yeah and, yeah, and the yeah. phone is also like the bridge to the outside world that doesn't really understand you know how the school works and why the school would be allowing a child to answer the phone and exactly. so if you're calling, you know, if UPS just wants to know when when you're coming to get your package and it's a five-year-old answering the phone, you know, they might draw all kinds of conclusions about what kind of business you're running and exactly maybe isn't the best look. <laughs> well, and that, that's why why I was concerned for setting up a way to train them into answering phones rather than just, yeah. you know, kind of free-for-alling it and saying, okay, go for it, you know. Yeah, um, no, no. Is, totally makes sense. You know, there's a crucial business function, <laughs> uh, not to mention public relations function, uh, yeah. even if it's small, but it is still important. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. It, you know, it's funny. You've used that term crucial business function twice now, Don, and it's just too good an invitation for me to talk about a change that we made to circle school governance near, nearly two years ago now, mm -hmm. where school meeting decided to delegate its power and responsibility for those crucial business functions to a position that we call the managing staff member. Oh, okay. um, so things like management of staff, uh, being responsible for anything that is a critical business function, the, the phone mm -hmm. answering, paying bills, those sorts of things, uh, legal responsibility, mm -hmm. admissions mm -hmm. functions, maintaining the campus yep, yep. to a, a position taking it out of the cloud school meeting to use that cloud right. metaphor again was sort of a cloud mm -hmm. and our experience mm -hmm. as staff was that it, if your if your manager is a cloud and they're only in session for two hours a week yeah. you don't really have the support of a manager yeah exactly yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah we made a change to sort of give one person the responsibility for those crucial business functions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's that's you know it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's I worked mean, out pretty well so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it worked for a long time before that. So before, you know, making that yeah. change. So then um, that, that, that I think is one of the interesting things about these uh, schools is that, you know, whatever context you're in, the pressures on it from the outside can, can vary a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any, any sort of challenging interactions with kind of agencies or organizations outside the school, like, you know, zoning or buildings or insurance or, you know, it, it, are any of those things issues for y'all? None currently, thankfully. I know in the past there, there have been bureaucrats with the state government who didn't seem to like us and mm. uh, ne never caused any actual trouble for mm. the school, but caused employees of the school to have to waste a lot of time proving and reproving compliance with things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of that. The building we're currently in was designed by the school for the school. Oh, and so wow. I think that there was okay. a lot of those issues with the construction of the building and making it, you know, compliant to regulations. People were like, well, what are you even doing in here? And right, right. Why... <laughs> You're telling me this room isn't a, a ninth grade classroom? <laughs> well, yeah, what yeah, is exactly. this room? An adult stationed in here at all times. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and those are the kinds of things I was I think it was a, might have been the women on Australia. I, I, anyway, but yeah, that oh no, it was it was, it was uh, Mora in Ireland. Mora and no, I'm forgetting the other person. Anyway, the the women I was talking to in Ireland, they actually, you know, were were having a you know having to talk to the inspectors and things. But for them, it actually ended up being a a in Ireland they ended up adopting a school that was a school before. And now they're just mm. changing the use of it, but yeah, it's it's it's, it's always interesting how those yeah you know, <laughs> the the po possibilities are are, are can be challenging. Mm -hmm. Tell me about sort of the people you serve, the families that you serve. Is there a demographic? Is there a way to describe them, or are they, you know, hmm. too diverse? <laughs> <laughs> well, the goal is for them to be too diverse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think that's important if you're running a democratic school to mm. to reflect. The demographics around the school mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. the nature of the school being so unique True. one common factor among the families is that they're all willing to go outside of the norms yep. and to question the long-standing principles of our current society mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. beyond that 
I know you'd have more information on demographic. <laughs> yeah, interestingly, to sort of piggyback on that point, I think a career path that is overrepresented in our alumni and in parents of our current students historically has always been entrepreneurs and, yeah. and small business owners. Mm -hmm. Exactly for that that sort of <laughs> willingness to try something different. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting one. Let's see, we, we try to be diverse in many ways, racially diverse, economically diverse, politically diverse, mm -hmm. across many different spheres. Are there aspects of that that are challenging for you as a community? Yeah, I think there's, it's a private school, it's tuition based. Right. Mm -hmm. So the threshold for economic diversity is a little different mm -hmm. than at a public school. And then you know, based on region and time frame and just like what's going on globally, I think where we have the most challenge changes from time to time. Mm. I think mm -hmm. historically the school has had, well, I guess actually, I don't know about percentage wise, mm. the school's racial diversity isn't always what the school has wanted it to be, Okay, mm -hmm. but it's, it's very different year to year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's one that fluctuates. And I, f I feel like even on the up years, we still are like, well, we would love for this to be even better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And well, maybe that's consistent. Like the up years, if the up years were consistently. Yeah. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that might be the one that's particularly visible. Some of the yeah. like socioeconomic and political diversity isn't quite as visible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Very interesting. So, so I'm going to kind of start moving us towards the wrapping up. So, so let, let's actually, yeah, let's go to a, another story. So tell me a story of a time when the school or a particular learner faced a challenge. And after facing that challenge, the school was better for it or the person was, you know, uh, better for it in one way or another. Hmm. You got anything? Thinking. <laughs> what are you thinking of? I have one that's coming to mind, and I feel like if I thought longer, I would probably think of a better one. But here's <laughs> here's what's in my mind. This is another one about myself as a student. Hmm. I, when I was uh, probably about 14 or 15, realized I had never been off the continent of North America. I was born mm -hmm. in Canada, spent mm -hmm. time in, oh, okay. you know, was, was raised in America, but I'd never been outside of North America. And I decided that I wanted to go to Europe. Okay. So I went into school at the circle school the next day and I spoke to a staff member and I said, I want to plan a trip to Europe. And we spent about two and a half years planning this trip, me mm -hmm. and, and two staff and four of my peers by the end of it were, was who was left and who went on the trip. Nice. Um, and it was a really satisfying experience for me. I think what I was doing in that process was developing sort of the meta skill that I think all of our kids who spent significant time here develop, which is the, the ability to look at something you want to do to set a goal mm. and to figure out the steps towards that goal. Mm. I think that that's something that students are uniquely able to practice in schools like this. And so I did that. And I think that the school was better off in several ways because of that. I think, well, one of the ways that we fundraised was by selling spaghetti every Thursday for two years. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that that became sort of this sweet ritual for the community mm. while we were there. Another way that we fundraised was by inviting families to occasional game nights and, uh, and selling food to make money. Mm -hmm. And so I think for the community of the school, uh, it was enriching. But I think it, it was also good for the school on another level, which is that it sort of demonstrated what can happen at mm. a school like this. It, it gives you something to point to, to say that that is possible. It won't be mm. easy. It will take a lot of work, but it is possible. And I think that there's something inspiring about a school that has been around now for 40 years and has stories like that to, to show current students or prospective students what you can do if you have the the time and space and the drive mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. I think the story that I'm thinking of now is 
related to learning the ASL classes that we have here. So there was a student named Ethan who was really, he was interested in learning American Sign Language here at school. And he wasn't really sure how would be the best way to pursue that at school. So I think he met with one of our staff members and they sort of weren't sure how much the interest would grow at the school. Mm. So they decided just to make a sign. He put it up on, we had like a happenings board Mm. where anyone who's interested could sign up to learn, you know, American Sign Language. And quite a few people signed up and we started meeting and just learning off of the internet at first. And some people ended up dropping out and whatever. But when Mm -hmm. we got down to this core group of people, we spent months every week, meeting every week for like an hour for months, learning off of the internet. And a year later, we came back and we were all really interested in continuing Hmm. to learn sign language. And we wanted to know what the next best way to do it was. We're like, we're done with just learning it off of YouTube. We want something better. Hmm. And recently, last year, we ended up getting a ASL instructor, a deaf teacher who was going to school to become an interpreter, who would come in and do classes with us every week. And the student who actually started that is now at college where some big part of that is his ASL experience. I'm not sure if he's majoring in it, minoring in it, but it's like ASL is one of their big programs there. Hmm. And the amount of people who are learning ASL has just grown since we got the instructor. And so I think it's been really beneficial to the school community to have like this learning experience that so many people are interested in Mm. and have been able to achieve and figure out together like how we could make it happen because we had some issues like how are we going to pay our instructor like where's the money going to come from and what are we going to do with that Uh uh-huh and you're able to to go to the school meeting and and get that handled i take it we had one of our staff members who's helping us we figured out she kind of helped us figure out ways that we could get like grants for oh. our instructor. Yeah. And it, it also actually, I think sort of encouraged, but also coincided with a shift in the way that our school government allocates resources and funding. So um, at the end of last school year, we created something called a resource committee that has a multi-thousand dollar budget line item each year. And can in- nice. any student can go to that. And it's, it's a little bit more accessible than a school meeting. Mm-hmm. To get money to for either materials or or instruction or experiences, help with field trip money, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like that really benefited the school to again sort of demonstrate what is possible. That if you mm-hmm. if you have a group of people who have demonstrated serious interest in this thing, and they are sort of exhausting the resources that we currently have on campus to show, well, here's a path towards gaining more expertise. Than mm. what we already have available here. Nice, nice, very cool. So, yeah. so as we're wrapping up, tell us how should people get in touch with the Circle School? What what's the best way to get get find out more and and get in touch? Mm. Well, check out our our website circleschool.org, and I am our social media manager. So I want to say definitely check out our Instagram page. Uh-huh. It is at Circle School. And what I try to do with, with that feed there is it sort of taps into, I said that the school in many ways is based on sort of an optimistic view of the human spirit. What I try to do with those posts is just essentially tell the stories and celebrate what kids do, what they choose to do when they're free to choose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I like to tell the stories of these amazing things that are going on that, that these amazing people are doing each week. So that's definitely a, a fun place to go and just see visually and then read about what's going on. Mm-hmm. Cool. Cool. Pepper, do you have anything for uh, somebody who might be considering school, someone, a uh, teenager, someone about your age, or, or, you know, just a kid who's, who might be interested? I would say definitely look into it. Mm-hmm. It's, I think, a great way of learning for people who are interested in it. And I would encourage anybody who has any interest at all to do a little more research and reach out to us if you're in the area. Nice. Nice. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and we're going to call it a day. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Enjoyed it. All right.
This has been the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I would love to hear from you. Please share what resonates with you from this episode. What do you think about schools that support children to exercise their agency on a daily basis? Agentic schools operate from within a new education paradigm. I wrote the Agentic Schools Manifesto to help you make sense of that new paradigm. The manifesto is available as a membership benefit when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more. This vodcast is a co-production of Attituder Media and Deeper Learning Advocates. At Deeper Learning Advocates, we seek to embed the psychology of learning in policy so that policy stops undermining learning. The financial support of our audience is crucial to accomplishing that mission. You can find out more about the manifesto and join the cause at dladvocates.org. One final thing, I also offer a free course called Motivation Myth Busting for School Teachers. To sign up, visit holisticequity.org. Go to the Tools tab and click on Free Motivation Course. Thank you for your kind attention.